We're going to kick off a series. It's called A Christmas Story. Maybe you've heard, the, heard about the movie. Maybe you've seen it. I honestly haven't, so I'm not recommending it or not recommending it. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not recommending it or not not recommending it. But regardless, we're going to be talking for the next three weeks about some different Christmas stories. And then what we're hoping to do from every single message is there's going to be a step of obedience. Like, here's what I need to do because of this Christmas story that we talked about at youth group. But before we dive into tonight's story, which one of the classic tales, right, of the Christmas season, I want to test some of your Christmas Bible knowledge. You ready for this? So lean in deep. There's literally no prize if you get all these right, but I'll give you an air high five. What town was Jesus born in? Just shout it out. Just shout it out. (laughs) Bethlehem. What, what, um, like what kind of place was Jesus born in? Mars? Oh, a manger. Yeah, manger. Yeah, I heard there were some supply chain issues, so they had to go to the manger. How about this? What did the angels say? The shepherds looked up in the sky. What did the angels say? Do not be afraid. That's not what I wrote down, but that's good. Didn't they say glory to God in the highest? No? I was thinking about it. I was hoping somebody would say, like, hark the herald angels. But then, like, I don't think they said that, first of all. But that'd be, like, them introducing themselves. That's, like, when, like, DJ Khaled goes, DJ Khaled. Like, the angels show up in the sky. They're like, hark the herald. Shouldn't have, should have left that one in my practicing. All right, how about this one? How many wise men were there? False. Read your Bibles. Nowhere in the Bible does it say there were three wise men. There were three gifts that were brought. So you could assume that there were three people. But if you're anything like me, I don't bring people birthday presents. So they also weren't at the manger. Anyone else not bring people birthday presents? Just me. Sorry, I should work on that. Don't invite me to your birthday party. So we're going to talk about the wise men tonight. We don't know if there were three. We don't know if there were 30. But they were wise and they were men. And there's little icons back there. Oh, those are our our girl small group leaders. But they're behind the girl small group leaders. You guys want to hold them up? So just like, this is what wise men look like. Yes, so wise. So wise, beautiful. And what I want to do is I'm going to read the whole story to you. It's probably been a while since you've like read this entire story of the wise men. And then we're going to see how do the wise men respond to this whole situation? How do we need to respond? So here we go. It's all on the screen. You can pull up your, your Bible app on your phone. You can pull up your notes app. Write down some things that you see that are sticking out. But regardless, let's tune in together. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea. So we literally just skipped like the whole like manger scene and all that. That already happened. That's what verse 1 is saying. And this was all during the reign of a guy named King Herod. And about that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem. They started asking... Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw a star arise, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, and everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting with all his leading priests and teachers and the religious law and said, Where is this Messiah? Every time you hear the word Messiah tonight, I want you to think Savior, the person that was going to come and save the people of Israel. Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? I lost my place. It wasn't for dramatic effect. Verse 5. In Bethlehem, in Judea, he said, For this is what the prophets wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. So that was the Old Testament that was written. And now we're in the New Testament, the second book of the New Testament in Matthew. All right. Then Herod, the king, called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared, and he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. Spoiler alert, he wasn't wanting to worship him. Do you think a king would go and worship a little baby? No, he wanted to... What what number am I on? 11? Then, 
After the interview, the wise men went their way, and the stars they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. There was no Google Maps back in 0 AD. Do we understand that? They were looking up to a star, and they were following it, and it led them to, to this town. And then when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. Verse 11, they entered the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So what I want to do is I want to look at this story of the wise men and see how they responded to the different situations going on. Back row, please stop talking. Thank you. It's been a long week for anybody else? Just me? Just me? Okay. Pray for me. I want you guys to, to see something really cool, okay? And that is this. Have you ever heard, like, a friend, somebody on, on TikTok, like, try to cancel the Bible and be like, the Bible's just made up, it's a made up story? By raise of hands, have you ever heard, the Bible's just a made up story? If you've heard that, no offense to the person you heard that for, but they don't know what they're talking about. And they've probably never read the Bible, because some crazy things about the Bible is that it's like one of the most historically authenticized works of history that you could ever see, like, compared to all these other, like, literatures and things that supposedly were written by these people. The Bible is proven. Mark talked about that like months ago and it was really encouraging to know, oh wow, the Bible is like legit. But what's really cool about the Bible is you've got the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there were books that were written thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, all before Jesus shows up on the scene. And when we talk about the Christmas story, years, years and years prior to Jesus showing up, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, Things were written about this Savior. I'm talking like 800, 900 years. And these prophets would, would, would they wouldn't predict, because predicting is like guessing that something's going to happen. They would say, no, this will happen. And, and you just wait for it. Ready? Isaiah 7, 14. Isaiah, this guy, I think seven, 800 years before Jesus shows up, prophesies that a pure young woman will give birth to God's son. Do we know who that person was? Mary. And that just happened. Matthew 1.18 is where that shows up. Isaiah 9.6, Isaiah prophesies that Jesus or, or this Messiah will come as a baby. We know the Christmas story. Jesus came as a baby, right? God could have sent his son however he wanted to, but he chose to do it as a baby. Jesus is described by all those names, right? Wonderful counselor, everlasting God, all those things. Micah 5.2, this guy Micah, another prophet, he says, Jesus will be born in a town called Bethlehem. Where was Jesus born? A town called Bethlehem. Crazy stuff. And the scribes in Matthew 2, they've studied the scriptures, all these different things. Next thing you know, they're like, we got to go there. That's Bethlehem. We got to go, we got to go find this Jesus. And so it, I just want you guys to realize how crazy it is that the Christmas story is not just a story. It's like the Christmas story. This is an incredible thing to know that, that years and years prior, people were saying things like Matthew 5, 2. But you, O Bethlehem, you're a small village, but yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in distant past, like God, who has not been created, who, who always was, always will be, right? Will come from you on my behalf. Numbers 14, 7. I see him, not here and now, and this, again, hundreds of years ago, I perceive him, but far in a distant future, a star will rise in Jacob, a scepter will emerge from Israel. So let's look at what the wise men did, and let's see how can we respond because of the way that the wise men responded. Are you ready for it? If you're ready for it, say, I'm ready for it. All right, let's go. The first one is this. They trusted God's word. And because they trusted God's word, so will I. I will trust God's word. The wise men were considered very wise because they studied the scriptures all of the time. They were looking at the Old Testament. They were looking for the signs of this Messiah to come. And then they just somehow knew that when that star showed up in the sky, they needed to go follow that star. Do you, do you guys think you have that kind of faith? I know mean, that's a crazy example, but think about the faith that it must have took. The trust in the scriptures that it must have took for them to go, we're going to pack up from our eastern ways or wherever exactly they were, and we're going to go to Jerusalem. We're going to go and find this Messiah. And the question I want you to ask yourself is, do you trust God's word? Do you trust God's word when it says things like this? God will work out 
all things for the good of those who love him and call according to his purpose. Do you trust that that's true when you're going through a really hard time? Do you trust that's true that when you don't get into the college that you really hope that you could get into or stuff at home is not going very well? Do you trust that... Do you believe that when you trust in the Lord with all your heart and you don't lean on your own understanding, but you acknowledge God in all your ways, that he'll make your path straight? A lot of us try to control our path. and No, this is what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get this job. I'm going to make this much money. I'm going to buy a Tesla. Anyone stream to just buy a Tesla? Yeah. Do you trust that God's way and he'll make your path straight? Do you trust that even when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you can fear no evil and know that God is with you, that God will never leave you or forsake you. The wise men trusted God's word, and so we've got to trust God's word. We've got to know God's word in our heart. We've got to meditate on it day and night, knowing that out of the overflow of our time spent with God and his word, we're going to be able to walk into crazy situations in our life. I don't think any of us will be called to, to follow a star to Bethlehem. But God's going to call us to some crazy things, and we've got to trust that God's word is from God and that he's speaking it to us. So, first thing we have to do, trust God's word. The second thing we see in the wise men's story is they acknowledged Jesus' power and purpose. So I will too. What does that mean, to acknowledge God's power and purpose? King Herod... He, he got a little intimidated by a baby, which is pretty funny, right? King Herod hears about this, this messianic newborn king in Bethlehem, and he's like, yeah, I want to go worship him with you guys, a.k.a. I want to kill him. In fact, Herod, King Herod ended up killing all these little boys like a few chapters later because he's like, I want to make sure there's no king that tries to rise up against me. But the wise men... They knew, they understood God's power. They understood God's purpose. In fact, in verse 12, it says, when it had time, when it had come time for them to leave, to leave like hanging out with the newborn king, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. They recognized God's power and authority. They knew from studying the scriptures that this Messiah would come, that some crazy things would happen to them, that he, like, he was coming to save the world. So they're like, we're not going to mess up this plan. And we want to be the people that follow that star and see this all happen. They trusted God's power and purpose. And so do you trust God's power and purpose in your life? Do you trust that he's got a good purpose for you? And his purposes will prevail. Or do you kind of just like try to control everything in your life and be like, no, I'm not going to let go of this. Oh, like, no, God God wouldn't want me to, right? We need to focus on God's purpose. We need to daily choose. I'm going to put Jesus on the throne of my heart, on my life. And when I do that, I'm allowing him to rule and reign. When Jesus came as the the newborn king, he was the, the most powerful baby, most powerful person on the earth even though he was a baby. And we have to acknowledge him as the king of our hearts every single day, dying to ourselves, putting him on the throne of our hearts. So number one, I trust God's word. That's what the wise men set that example for us. Number two, I acknowledge that Jesus has power and he's got purpose, like the wise men did. And number three, I, these wise men, they worship Jesus And so I will worship Jesus. If you zoned out this entire time and you haven't stopped talking since I've asked you to 12 minutes ago, focus in on this last point, all right? They worship Jesus, so I will worship Jesus. They they showed up and they said, I'm looking for a newborn king. We have come to worship him. What was their purpose of following a star? It wasn't to just be like, hmm, I wonder if that prophecy was real. No, they knew it was real, but they're like, I want to worship. They had expectation of worshiping. And what made them so wise is that they had their priorities straight. Like they knew that worshiping the Messiah was the only right response. After all their years of studying these scriptures, they could have taken away all these different things, but they realized, no, this is it. We're not waiting for somebody else to come. And when they got to that house, not only did they, they worship God with their voices, right? Like sometimes when we sing, we're worshiping God with our, our words, but they showed him. Middle schoolers, what do I say every Sunday morning what worship is? It's showing and telling God how much he's worth. So not only did they tell him, oh God, you're worth all this. No, they showed him. How did they show him? 
We just read this story. What did, can, can somebody just say it? They bowed down. They bowed down and they brought gifts. That's their way of showing God how much he's worth. Think about the humility that it would take to bow down before a, a, a newborn baby and say, this is the king. This is the savior. This is the person that's going to do it all for me. It's incredible. Something that's really cool about the gifts. Grant, you guys can come back up. Something that's really cool about the gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, is that they're kind of symbolic if you look at them. It's not written in the scripture, but you can take it and realize that when they bring Jesus gold, gold is valuable. Gold is like the most valuable thing. Like you don't bring bronze to a, a king. What do you bring? Gold. That's the point, right? You bring gold to a king, and they, sh- they said, no, you are so valuable, we're going to bring you the most valuable of elements. Frankincense. Frankincense was an incense that priests would use for offerings. A priest was somebody that would stand in the gap between the people of Israel, all the people. Pretend we're all Israelites, okay? We've got a God who's super holy. He doesn't want us to sin. When we sin, bad things happen. The earth opens up and we get swallowed down. If you don't know that story, that's okay. And a perfect God. And a priest would come and they were like given the authority to stand in the gap, be a middleman for the people. Because if God got into the presence of the people, it's like bang, 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 you're done. But this priest will go into God's presence and he would, it would be an atoning opportunity, which means the, the, the sins are getting covered. And so when they bring them frankincense, we get to see how Jesus is our high priest. You guys remember the bridge, right? We talk about it a whole lot. Jesus was the high priest who stood in the gap between our sinfulness, my sinfulness, all the wrong things that I've done, all the commands that I've broken, and a holy God that, that's up there in heaven and wants to spend forever with me, but, but my sin is separating me. But Jesus, the high priest, comes and stands in the gap. And the beauty of the bridge is that the cross, what he did on the cross, and, and defeating death and all those things, bridges the gap between my sin and God's holiness. So gold and frankincense and, and myrrh. Myrrh was an oil that you would use, pour on, on a dead body. And how symbolic is that to think, wow, the whole reason Jesus even came was to die. That's crazy, right? Jesus didn't come to be like, hey guys, here's how to live a good life. Here's how to, here's how to stay away from parties and here's how to stop cursing. That wasn't what, what his goal was. That, that might be some of the fruit of of a relationship with him, but his goal was to, to save dead people at the bottom of an ocean that can't save themselves and bring them back to life and bring them up so they could spend forever with him and enjoy all the perks of being in a relationship with the creator of the world. Is that not good news? And so God's calling you to respond tonight. God's calling you to be like the wise men who, who chose, I'm going to, I'm going to, value God's word. I'm going to acknowledge Jesus' power in in all of that purpose, and I'm going to worship Jesus. Some of you guys, like, you haven't, you haven't given your whole life to Jesus. Maybe you heard that example of putting God on the throne of your heart, and you realize, no, I'm on the throne of my heart. I'm letting myself make my decision. I'm leading it. And you realize, man, that's just making you come up short. You're falling short of that. That's not, that's, there's, you're not seeing anything good come in your life. I'm telling you, Jesus is there and he's like, hey, let me be that person that just radically changes your life. If you want to give your your heart and your life over to Jesus and that's your step of of worshiping him and responding to him, I want you to come find me at the end of this song before we do small groups. I want you to find a leader and they can lead you through a simple prayer. It's not a magical prayer, but it's just a prayer that says, I'm admitting I'm sinful. I believe that Jesus wants to stand in the gap for my sins. And I'm confessing with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he is Savior, that he is the King. Others of you, you, you've already done that. You've given your heart to Jesus. But you need to stop doing things that aren't honoring God, that aren't showing him worship, that aren't making him the King of your life. You've got to repent of those things. You could do that. Repentance is a beautiful thing because you can feel like you're miles and miles away and it's just one step back into a right relationship with Jesus. That's how amazing this Christmas story is. 
of what God's done. So, if you want to do this with me, I have a, a, a kind of a true statement on the screen, starting with, by God's grace. And I want you, if you believe this, to say this with me. And I'm going to read it for you first. It says, by God's grace, I will trust God's word. That, that means it's not easy for me to like, read my Bible all the time, but by God's grace, I'm going to trust that I, I can have a fruitful time in my relationship with him through the word. And I will acknowledge God's power and God's purpose, and I will worship Jesus with my life. By God's grace, I will worship. When I walk out of those doors, I'm not talking about a song. I'm talking about a life, a living sacrifice. I'm living a life of worship to God. So if you want to say that with me, um, make, it, make it your prayer. Make it your truth statement tonight that you will do these things. And let's all stand. And if you want to, if you want to read this with me, we can do it. So here we go. One, two, three. By God's grace, I will trust God's word. I will acknowledge God's power and purpose. I will worship Jesus with my life.